When we think of wine, I think it's most often associated today for its alcoholic properties. You know, people might have a glass of wine on a Friday evening uh, while watching something on Netflix. But in the ancient world, wine was much more widely used and much more widely important than it is today. It was used as a food stuff, but also uh, in medicinal cures. Uh, and it was also used for cooking. It was used for a very, very wide variety of functions. And today I want to talk about wine and feasting. So as part of this session on feasting, uh, wine is a critical component of feasting uh, in the ancient world, especially in the ancient Greco-Roman world. My name is Connor Trainer. I'm in the Department of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Warwick. And uh, this is in Vino Veritas, making wine in the classical world. So the opening picture here, we see the god Dionysus, uh, seated. He's the god of wine in ancient Greece, and he's holding out a cup known as a kylix. And this is a wine cup. He's holding the cup under um, vines with grapes on them, as you can see. And I thought this is quite a nice way to begin this lecture because we can see um, really a very physical manifestation of, of wine. And the fact that the Greeks had a god specifically um, concerned with wine, I think attests to its importance. We don't have um, anything really quite like that in the modern world. Wine and grapes from where wine originates uh, was part of something known as the Mediterranean triad. And this is really the fundamental elements of the Mediterranean diet, which include olives and a secondary product, olive oil. And olive oil and olives were used, uh, again, as foodstuffs and medicine uh, for lights, um, for oil, as, as we would use oil, for a range of other things, for hygiene as well. Uh, we have wheat or grain, which was kind of the main source of calories in the ancient Mediterranean. And we have grapes, which were, again, important as a foodstuff, but also as a drink. Uh, and they would be they, they're the basis of wine um, for consumption, but also wine in medicine and wine um, for a range of other uh, uses. So wine at its most basic is a combination of grapes or grape juice specifically and yeast. And when yeast, whether it's natural yeast or yeast from a little sachet for anybody who's interested in baking, um, when yeast combines with the sugar, the natural sugars in grapes, um, we see this process known as fermentation. And that changes grape juice into wine. The particular type of grapes that are most associated with are the particular class of grapes that are most associated with wine production are the vitis vinifera, or the so-called domesticated grapevine. And we see an image here in this map in the lower part of the image where um, particularly um, common areas for growing uh, grapes um, are highlighted. And this is really specifically with reference to the ancient world. So you can see all around the, the coastline of the Mediterranean, especially in the northern coasts and um, in the Black Sea area. And then over to the um, so-called Fertile Pre uh, Crescent and by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, in the Middle East. So wine was very widespread and it almost certainly found its origins in and around the area of the Black Sea. Here's just a gratuitously nice photograph of a, of a vineyard. To grow grapes, you need to have a certain amount of sunshine uh, and a certain amount, amount of warmth as well. And ideally, grapes should be grown on, on gently sloping hills. In, in Greece, particularly, it's north sloping hills are, are, are generally regarded as being best suited for grape production. 
So wine is made in three basic steps. There are dozens, if not hundreds of variations in how we, uh, in the winemaking process, but the three basic steps have remained the same since antiquity. The first one is harvesting grapes. The second one is pressing grapes and extracting the juice. And the third one is putting that juice into some sort of a vessel for fermentation. And as I mentioned, fermentation is when yeast reacts with the sugar in the grape juice. We see here the tomb of Nacht from the New Kingdom in Egypt, a very, very clear illustration of the winemaking process. So if you look on the right of this image, you see two people picking grapes. Uh, one of them is picking um, grapes, another one is holding grapes and is holding a basket uh, to, to, to collect the grapes in. If you look at the left side of this image, you see um, five people who are standing in a treading platform. They're holding on to ropes, and you can see the grapes represented on the floor. So they would be stamping on the grapes with their feet and extracting the juice. This would be a waterproof uh, tank, and it would have an overflow or a flow pipe out of it. Now, if you look in the middle of this image, you can see someone bending down uh, and gathering the grape juice, it looks like it's coming out of a fountain. That person then would put the grape juice into the one of the four uh, vessels above. There are four clay vessels represented there. And that is where the fermentation would have taken place that turned the grape juice into what we would regard as wine. So even when this was, was illustrated um, back in the Bronze Age, um, the, the process for making wine really has the essential components have remained the same. Winemaking is very ancient and the human relationship with alcohol is more ancient. Uh, the origins of, of, of human alcohol consumption are, are really unclear. Although there is a compelling thesis known as the drunken monkey hypothesis, which suggests that monkeys um, or primates um, had a preference for eating fruit that was decomposing and therefore slightly naturally fermented. And the slight alcoholic properties of decomposing fruit was something that was desirable to, to primates and has been for a long time. And I believe there are genetic mutations uh, in, in primates and thus in humans uh, that reflect uh, this uh, preference or this um, tolerance at least uh, for alcohol. Um, it's a somewhat humorously titled um, theory, but it has genuine academic merit and, and deserves consideration. As far as actual wine manufacture goes, the earliest evidence that we have comes from Georgia. And it comes from two caves in the country of Georgia, which is just uh, in the area of the Black Sea and the Caucasus. Uh, the Shulaveris Gora and the Gada Shirili Gora are two caves in which archaeologists have dated occupation to um, somewhere between 6,000 and 5,800 BC, a period known as the early Neolithic period. And from these caves, we have evidence of wine production. And this, as far as we know, is the earliest um, that we can confidently attach to wine production, or the earliest evidence that we can confidently attach to wine production. Um, the vessels, or the types of vessels that they found, um, include one like this in the picture here on the left, which is a very large 300 liter clay jar. So 300 liters, you're thinking something like 600 pints. That's a lot of wine, not quite 600 pints, but close to it. This is an enormous amount of wine. And wine leaves um, trace remains, residues that archeologists, specifically bioarchaeologists um, can detect. And one of the most telltale signs um, is, is something called tartaric acid. And you can find that on the inside of pots. So we can confidently, really quite confidently, um, say that you know, winemaking has been part of um, the human experience for you know, roughly speaking uh, 8,000 years. Now staying in the same Caucasus region, we move over to Armenia, where we look at the Areni One cave and this dates to slightly later than, than the Georgian caves. Uh, it's 4,000 BC, thereabouts. And this cave provides something very interesting. It's not the earliest evidence for, for, for wine manufacture, 
but it's the earliest context where we can trace out the entire process of wine manufacture and consumption. So in this cave, we have evidence um, that suggests a treading platform, a collection vat. It also, we have evidence for fermenting vessels, as well as drinking cups and burials. So with this, we can see how wine was manufactured. We can see how it was consumed. And we can see how it was used in a ritual context, such as a burial in this case. So this is very important evidence. It is almost certain that wine production remained um, a, a continual feature of these societies um, during the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. And by the Middle Bronze Age, so by about 1900 to 1600 um, BC, uh, we have some very interesting evidence from Tel Cabri in Israel. And this seems to be the first evidence of a wine cellar. So that's where we have uh, wine that's kept for specific reasons. So be it a vintage or be it a, a flavored wine or something else. And indeed from, from this evidence, archeologists have estimated that there were up to about 2000 liters of wine stored in, the, uh, in, the, in, in this palace. And they would have had wines flavored with honey, resin and mint amongst other things. So very interesting. Now we probably most commonly associate wine consumption uh, with, with ancient Greece. And indeed wine was a very, very central part of ancient Greek culture uh, and ancient Greek uh, religion. The Greeks certainly did not invent wine, but um, it really became a, a very important feature of their society. And here we have the inside of a, of a wine cup, a kylix, uh, with the Greek god Dionysus uh, depicted in a boat. And you can see the mast of the boat um, has turned into uh, sort of a vineyard. There are grapes growing out of this. And there are dolphins, which um, were, at least according to a story or one interpretation, were once pirates. Athens had a festival called the Amphisteria every year. And this would have been in sometime February or March. And the Amphisteria was a new wine festival. So wine would have been fermented in clay pots known as pithoi, more on this later. And at the end of the fermentation process, there would have been a festival. And during that festival, these pots would have been opened and the Athenian population uh, would have been able to all partake in the new wine. And one interesting thing about this festival is it wasn't just adults. Uh, children were also involved in this festival. Uh, I, I can't stress strong enough how bad an idea I think that would be, um, letting groups of, of primary school children um, at massive jugs of wine. Uh, but anyway, these differences are the things that make it so interesting. Uh, wine consumption is, is perhaps most um, associated with the symposium. And the symposium was an ancient Greek uh, dining, drinking party. Um, and these would have happened um, throughout the year and in, in private residences mostly, um, but also sometimes in, in, in public places. They were basically parties for elite meals in Athens, and they would have involved um, drinking, singing and dancing, and, and partying. And if we look at the image in the top left, we have a scene from a, 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 an ancient pot depicting a symposium. So you can see the men reclining on couches. And in some of the right hands, you can see they're holding something that looks sort of like a, like a twisted handkerchief. This is actually a, a type of cup known as a kylix, and it's a wine cup. And ancient wine wasn't filtered like modern wine, so there'd be sediment in the bottom of it. And one of the games that people used to play at the symposium was flicking the sediment from the bottom of their wine into a circle that had been drawn on a wall. And this game was called Cotopus. Um, it was like darts, but it must have been so much messier. In front of the men, we can see, uh, we can see a woman who's playing, playing an aulus or a flute. So they're suggesting there would have been music there as well. And on the floor in either side of, uh, in front of uh, the couches, we can see two small tables. And on those tables, you can see, um, white triangular or square um, uh, drawings or paintings. And those represent barley cakes. And these would have been the standard food at, at a symposium. If you're drinking lots and lots of wine, um, you know, you want some food to soak it up. And so these barley cakes would have been sort of the ancient equivalent of, of, of soakage, your ancient kebab. 
um, for example, or whatever um, people have these days. We're very lucky in that we know quite a lot about symposia. Uh, ancient people who partook in symposia very often were buried with their favorite symposium vessels, which is kind of nice. It's, you know, you have a party, you're very pleased with that. Um, uh, and then you decide to take these to the grave with you or your family uh, would take them to the grave with you. So here at the bottom of this, we see a complete set of symposium related vessels, uh, everything from water vessels to wine cups uh, to craters. And the two craters uh, that I've highlighted here are actually the most important vessels probably in, in the symposium. And these vessels were for mixing water and wine. The ancient Greeks never drank their wine straight. They always mixed it with water. Um, and they believed that um, it was more pleasurable. They could drink uh, more over a longer period of time. And they thought it was barbaric, uh, people who drank very strong wine. So ancient wine would have been a lower alcohol percentage than modern wine anyway. And then if you mix that with water, you're probably looking at an alcohol equivalency of something um, like a beer. So, uh, you know, relatively low. We know of ancient winemaking um, um, from various media as well. And here we have two Roman examples. The example in the top left is a mosaic from the Greek city of Patras from the third century of our era. Uh, at that time, uh, Greece was part of the Roman Empire. And what we have here is a depiction of the god Pan with his goat horns and two men on either side of them. Those three characters are standing on a treading floor that's been filled with grapes. And you can see their feet pressing into these uh, greenish grapes. They're creating a juice from pressing them and the juice is flowing out of pipes and into three clay vessels in the lower foreground of, of the mosaic. At either side um, of, the, of the scene are two men carrying um, baskets, uh, presumably filled with grapes and they would, throw, they would be throwing these in um, to add more grapes for pressing. So it's kind of nice. We got a little snapshot, albeit a mythological one, uh, of ancient wine production. We also have archaeological evidence from Pompeii. We have the remains of a wine production site here. Um, and you see this in the lower right. This site itself, or this production facility itself, um, involves uh, basically two, um, two halves. So if you look at the lower half of the picture, you can see the area, there's a, a two, a one, and a square in the middle. That would be the regular floor where people would enter this room. At the right of that, you see the black and white dotted floor. This would be the treading floor. So the grapes would go there, and the people would stamp on the grapes to extract the juice. The juice would then flow into um, two collection reservoirs, which are labeled at two and one, as you see. And those are also um, in black and white dots. From the collection reservoirs, winemakers would scoop out um, the juice and then they would bring them into the other side of the winemaking facility and they would put them um, into clay vessels for fermentation. And we see this in the top half of this image, uh, the room with this sort of 10 concentric circles. These concentric circles are representative of dolia. And these are clay vessels where wine fermentation took place, which we'll see shortly. So in Italy, wine fermentation took place in clay vessels known as dolia. In, in Greece, these are known as pithoi, but they serve basically exactly the same function. Um, they're almost exactly the same as the, the very ancient um, jar that we saw from Georgia as well. Um, again, big clay fermentation vessels. Uh, these images come from, from Pompeii, and we can see some of them in the lower left especially. Uh, they're, they're very large vessels. They would be set into the ground during the fermentation process or for the fermentation process. And by being partially buried, uh, this would help to regulate the temperature of the vessels. So for fermenting wine, you don't want temperatures to get too hot or to get too cold suddenly because it could disturb the yeast and damage the fermentation process. So having them mostly buried underground uh, is, is very good and very conducive for fermentation. So it's kind of nice that we can trace out this process archaeologically. The site that I currently work at is Knossos on the island of Crete. And I've recently studied 
a wine production facility there. Now, this isn't quite as clear as the examples from Pompeii, but you can see in the black and white photo in the lower part of this image, uh, there's in, in sort of the center top of the image, there's a rectangle, a darker rectangle, and that would be the collection vat. Off at the left side would have been the treading floor. It's since been damaged uh, and, and collapsed. And then to the right of the collection tank, we can just sort of make out a submerged uh, pithos or fermentation vessel. So again, you can trace out this wine manufacturing process in different societies and in different contexts. And this particular one dates to the second century BC, uh, the Hellenistic period uh, on the island of Crete. But what did ancient wine taste like? It's well and good knowing how it's made and it's well and good knowing about festivals, but what did it actually taste like? <clears throat> well, the ancient Greeks and Romans didn't seem to differentiate wine in the same way that we do. If you walk into a shop today, you might think, well, do I want a red or do I want a white or perhaps a rosé? In ancient times, they seemed to differentiate their wines based on flavor profiles. So was it sweet? Was it salty or savory? Salty, you say? Yes, salty. It's a very strange property in an ancient wine. We have a quote here from Pliny, uh, the ancient Roman author in his work, Natural History, where he talks about the people of Kos. And Kos is an island in the Aegean Sea, and was particularly well known for wine manufacture during the early Roman period. And Pliny tells us that the people of Kos mix seawater in large quantities with their wines, an invention which they first learned from a slave who adopted this method of supplying the deficiency that had been caused by his thievish propensities. Now, this is all very funny. So Pliny tells us that wine from Kos was salty or slightly salty. The reason it was slightly salty was because some slave used to steal wine from his master. He didn't want his master catching him stealing wine. So he used to top it up with seawater. Um, it's a nice story, but it's, it's almost certainly um, not true. Uh, we know of salty wines that were produced throughout the Greek world as well, including the island of Rhodes, which is just to the south of Kos, and was probably the largest producer of wine uh, in the ancient Greek world. And it seems that the salty profile was not only a desirable taste, but it also served medicinal purposes as well. So again, you know, you wouldn't probably go into your corner shop and order, you know, I'll have your bottle of a bottle of your finest salty wine, please. Um, Again, it's maybe not as recreational as that. So we should be thinking more in terms of, of, of medicines as well and different, um, different uses and properties of wines that the ancient people would have had. We also have evidence of wine from Crete. Now we know there are lots of ancient accounts of lots of different types of ancient wines. I've just selected these two um, because they're interesting, but you could do this for many regions in the ancient world. In Cretan wine, for example, we have accounts that say that Crete was famed for its raisin wine, which would have been a slightly sweet or even quite a sweet wine. They may have even added honey to the wine. We have Pliny again telling us about um, the raisin, raisin wine of Crete um, being extremely good. And it's the only one that was better than the raisin wine of Cilicia uh, or, or Africa. Uh, Cilicia being uh, modern uh, southern Turkey and Africa being the, the northern coast uh, of, of Africa today. So places like Libya. We have accounts from ancient medicinal writers, such as Dioscorides, who describes uh, passum, which is a sweet form of Cretan wine, as a cure for sore eyes, earache, headache. He also said it's good for prom uh, promoting fertility and expelling worms, but cautions that the sweet wine is not good for the stomach. I think I'd also take slight uh, umbrance of this too. I'm, I'm not sure if um, I would recommend sweet wine as a cure for a headache. Uh, uh, it could be the cause of a headache. But the important thing here is that we can see that ancient um, physicians recommended wine for medicinal purposes, as well as just purely for, for pleasure purposes uh, in, the, in the context of Pliny above, where he's talking about why this wine uh, tastes nice. Wine was transported widely in the ancient world. Probably the majority of wine would have been consumed locally, so we don't necessarily have evidence for that. But when wine was shipped, as it was um, 
in very large quantities throughout the Mediterranean especially, it tended to be shipped in clay vessels known as amphorae, or amphora in the singular. These vessels were all of a standard size and would have been loaded onto a ship, as you can see here from the ship reconstruction. And what's particularly interesting about amphorae is different regions had different styles of amphora. So you could look at an amphora and say, ah, this one is from the island of Rhodes, uh, whereas this one comes from southern Italy. Somewhat similarly today, when you get different wine bottles from different regions, um, like a Bordeaux wine bottle or perhaps a Chianti wine bottle from the 70s or 80s with the kind of palm uh, at the bottom of them. So it's a similar thing. The amphora here in the lower uh, right is from the island of Rhodes, and it has these very distinctive spiked handles. So they're very, very easy to tell um, this type of amphora. And it's very useful because where you see wine coming into certain regions and you can identify certain amphora types, you can start to consider trade links. So for example, we get wine from the island of Rhodes in Greece showing up in places as far flung as Wales. So these were transported very widely. That's all that I want to say about ancient wine today. I hope you found this interesting and useful. If you have any other questions uh, or if there's anything you'd like explained uh, any, in further detail or anything else, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, again, my name is Connor Trainer, and I'm at the University of Warwick. And I thought I would just end on a cautionary note here as uh, a man lying down who's clearly had too much to drink and has a, has a, a pail in front of him to catch what might be happening in the next few minutes. Um, uh, nothing in excess seems like a very sensible way to uh, to end this. Thank you for your time.